I'm going to give you some introduction about what digital systems are. Um, some of it is going to be very new to you. Some of this will sound very abstract. Um, some of that you'll go like, what? And then once you um, go further into this course and you look back at the first lecture, things will all of a sudden make a whole lot more sense. Um, so bear with me in this one. Um, so what's a digital system? Um, by definition, it's a system that takes a set of disc discrete information inputs. Um, it has some dis dis discrete um, internal information, the system state, and it spits out dis discrete information outputs. Now, when we say discrete, um, it's not like, shush, we shouldn't talk about it discrete. Uh, discrete as in um, individuals, as in non-continuous. It will be discrete in sort of um, two dimensions. It will be uh, that the quantities themselves can only take um, one of a finite number of um, values. Say, let's say the number is from 1 to 10. And it will be discrete in time. So we will look at our inputs and our outputs and the system states at given times, not overall as a continuous um, time. Again, a bit abstract now, it'll all come, uh, make sense very soon. Now, what are the two uh, major types of uh, digital system that we have? We have memory-less um, system, so no state is present. When we say state, and we will define it um, later in the course, we talk about memory elements. So, uh, when there's no state, uh, we talk about combinational logic systems where uh, whatever inputs you put into them right now, that's what's coming out, regardless of whatever you put in before, regardless of whatever happened beforehand. So we can actually formally say that the output is some function of the current input and nothing else. You change the input, you get um, the output that corresponds to it then. Um, in contrast to that, there's um, digital systems that um, do have states, that do have memory elements in them. They do remember what happened before. Um, and then the outputs um, could be functions of um, the current state of the system, which remembers um, what happened before, and the current inputs of the system. It could also be um, a function solely based on the state while ignoring the current inputs. Um, the situation might be that the inputs will actually affect what the current state is and then in turn the output will only depend um, on the current state. Indirectly it will depend on the input as well but um, <coughs> Not, not directly as we will um, see it when we build those things. We have names for them. Um, this is called a milli machine or a milli model. This one's called a Moore model. Now the current state of the circuit, so whatever um, the circuit remembers right now, so the current state may be a function of the previous state, so everything we've remembered so far, plus whatever inputs um, we give to our system. Now, so there's um, the two models for, um, for memory, um, for s systems that have memory elements. There's the Mealy model, the Moore model. We will talk about them um, in length in week six or seven. Um, but even then, you can divide them into um, two sort of subgroups. The, um, the synchronous sequential systems and the asynchronous synch sequential systems. The synchronous, the synchronous ones will only get updated, the current states and the current output. We only get updated at discrete times of some signal, usually um, a clocking signal into the system. The asynchronous one will change your outputs as soon as the current inputs change, regardless of whatever clocking signal there is. Again, don't worry too much if it goes way over your head for now. Um, an example, a very simple example of a digital system 
might be a digital counter. So we have two signals coming um, into the system. We have a signal that says count up. Every time we assert this signal, the counter will go up. We have a reset signal that um, whenever this reset is asserted, um, this will um, zero back to zero. The output we can define to be the visual display, so whatever um, whatever is in um, on the display or in the memory will be displayed out. And so um, the state is whatever um, the current value is. So in a sense, the output is really just a representation of the, of the state. Now we can think about this example as having the count up being a clocking signal that ticks every, say, every second. So it will count up um, every time we assert um, this clock. So we have sort of a second counter. And we can think of the reset signal that um, could be an asynchronous signal that can come in at any time regardless of the clock that will reset our, um, our counter. Again, it's an example, um, nothing too much to worry about. On the other spectrum of um, digital systems, um, there's a digital computer. A digital computer is um, a digital system. Um, it has memory, so it has a state. It has a lot of memory. Um, you will realize actually that it's got a whole lot more memory um, in comparison to the, sort of, um, the types of memories that we will talk about. Um, it also has the internal structure that is built by the control unit and the data path. And it's being um, controlled or it's getting signals from the I.O. devices, the input outputs. So first of all, as we all know, the inputs um, devices to a computer could be the keyboard, um, could be the mouse, maybe a wireless um, internet that's coming in. Um, if you have a microphone, that could be an input to a computer. The outputs are naturally the screen. Um, if you have a printer, that could be an output. Um, speakers, um, and again, wireless internet, you might transmit something out. Um, so these are all the IOs to a computer. Now internally, the data path, that's the main um, block that actually makes all the computations. Uh, the computation between whatever the inputs are and whatever is in memory, um, it, this is in a way the heart of the computer. And this is exactly what we learn about um, in week 10. Aside to that is the control unit. The control unit's um, um, job is to direct the right signals to the right places. So if an input comes into the CPU, the central processing unit, the control unit will direct those signals um, to the right places in the data path. It might um, ask the memory um, to give some more information and we'll combine it all together and hand it out to the data path that will actually execute um, the computational stuff. Um, we will get into the hearts of it um, towards the end of the course. Now, now we talked about a computer. Um, a sort of a smaller version of a computer are embedded systems. Embedded systems, if you want, are um, microcomputers, microcontrollers, sometimes they're called microprocessors. Um, they're all the same thing. They are pretty much um, microchips that um, do computational um, operations for us. Now, these days you can get um, microcontrollers or microprocessors in pretty much everything, um, in, in everything around you. Naturally, your mobile phone has a microprocessor in it. it um, it's a smart device. Um, other things like, you know, cars. Cars have tons of embedded systems in them, microcontrollers. Uh, they control the different systems. Um, dishwashers these days have um, embedded systems. TVs, um, GPSs are all based on um, microcontrollers. In fact, um, the school surveying upstairs um, build their own um, GPS receiver um, using a microcontroller and digital um, design. Um, more than that, I'll tell you that this was the assignment for last year's um, course. They actually had to build some components of a GPS receiver, um, which was actually very interesting. Now, um, the type of things, uh, microcontrollers, and microcomputers, microprocessors, are going to be what you will learn in ELEC 2142. 
In ELEC 2140, we will utilize an ARM microprocessor. Uh, we will learn how to program it um, and see what we can actually do with microcontrollers. There will be, by the way, it's, an, it's a warning, there will be a lot of programming involved in 2142, um, mostly C, and we will teach you assembly language as well. Um, I know some people are not too comfortable with programming in C, so I'm giving you one semester in advance warning that by the time we get to second semester, please be fluent in programming in C. Um, the type of stuff digital signal processors are not quite um, the same as microprocessors. They have very specific jobs to do um, signal processing. You will learn um, the basics of signal processing um, in 3104, um, digital signal processing. I know there's actually quite a lot of students who are doing this course now that may have stayed from Dr. Mb's lecture just before this one. Um, but specifically in our context, there is a fourth year elective. Um, oops. Uh, ELEC 4601, which will take the knowledge you, um, you've gained from um, DSP, Digital Signal Processing, and from what we teach you here in, in 2142, and we'll combine it all together um, to come up with optimized um, DSP processors. Now, just um, to give you a bit of a feel um, to how much Just to give you a bit of a feel of how much um, microcontrollers are produced, um, if you think about your, um, I'm still going to use a computer. If you think about personal computers that almost any household have these days, and you, you know you see them everywhere, and you think, yeah, there's tons of computers out there. The processors that run on home PCs make up only two percent of the microprocessors in the world. So there's 98% more microprocessors that you haven't even um, thought about. So just to give you a bit of a, um, a, bit of a feel of um, the order of what we get. Um, example of embedded system application, well, um, I sort of threw um, some at you before. Um, now, how do we actually control um, digital systems? Well, we have in the real world, we have physical signals uh, we can measure. Um, things like, you know, it's very hot in here. I know that there's high temperature. Um, things like weight, um, we measure in kilograms. Um, lengths, volumes, pressures, um, they all have their measuring units. And all of them are um, continuous physical quantities. When I say continuous, um, if you think about the temperature, for example, I can say, okay, it's probably, what, 32 degrees, probably, maybe 32.1, maybe 32.1579357, um, there's pretty much infinite um, accuracy that we actually get with uh, measuring those uh, quantities. And that applies for a lot of the other uh, quantities that I talked about, someone's weight or um, a volume, they're very precise. They can take any um, value in, you know, in some range. However, when we talk about digital systems, we talk about this discrete values. So that's more the stuff that we're used to. When we, again, back to talking about temperature, um, when we say the temperature now is 32 degrees. We don't bother saying it's 32.1 and then all the decimal digits. We sort of run it off to um, other the, the whole degree or maybe um, point, um, one decimal place um, after the point. Um, but we don't worry too much. And this is when we start getting into discrete quantities. Because there's so many quantities, say between zero degrees and say 40 degrees, then we can specify as whole degrees. Uh, so that's why we call it discrete. And this is what we talk about when we talk about digital systems. Now, formally speaking, digital systems, as long as the quantities are discrete, that would um, fall under a digital system. <coughs> Most of you know, however, that when, you know, the first thing you think about um, digital systems 
are the binary values um, 0 and 1, or two values, high and low voltage, are on and off. That's usually how we think about digital systems. Um, and yes, in fact, that's the uh, one most common way of designing uh, digital systems. The reason why we only use two values rather than, you know, say 10 discrete values is because two values um, let us have very robust um, designs. You will see later it gives us great immunity to noise. Um, it lets our system recover from um, unknown conditions. Um, and usually you would get um, pretty much what you were hoping for. If you take um, digital TV in respect to um, analog TV, you see the picture is much clearer. Why? Because there's a lot of redundancy built into the signal. Um, you, can, you can think about it a bit if you um, sort of understand how the signal works. Um, at the end of the day, the signal that we transmit on, um, even for digital TVs, it's an analog signal. It's a signal that we send through the air. It's, in a way, it's continuous. Um, it's, um, it can change in its value, not necessarily in discrete uh, matters. But we can sample this signal, and we can define it to be um, zeros and ones. Once we do this, then we can um, do error checking. We can verify that the um, value that we got is what we wanted. Um, and this is how we get sort of this crystal clear picture. Um, all right, so I mentioned um, binary values. So we will concentrate on two values um, during a study in this course. Um, how do we represent binary values? Well, the most common one will be using <coughs> digits 0 and 1. Sometimes uh, we refer to it as high or um, low, usually in context of voltages, high voltage, low voltage. Um, sometimes with um, Boolean arithmetic and um, Boolean logic, we talk about true or false values. Um, if you talk about switches, we might say um, on or off. Anything that um, gives us exactly two values um, is um, probably suitable um, for, a di for a digital systems. Now, in the digital TV example I just gave you, I said the values are actually analog um, signals. In a way, you might hear it from a lot of engineers, digital is not real. Digital is something we invented. We take analog signals and we force them um, to certain values. What we actually use for digital are those physical quantities that are, um, they have ranges of values. But then we make definitions and we say, if the range is between those two values, I'll take that as a one. If it's between those two values, I'll take it as a zero. Um, and here's some examples of um, signals that we might have. At the top, I've got sort of a timeline. And I've got, let's say, um, a clock signal. So that represented by um, those arrows. Let's, for example sake, that, example sake, say that this clock ticks every one second. So the spacing between um, each arrow is one second. Now, we have the analog signal that um, um, is continuous in both value and time. So the analog signal can change over time at any time. Um, and it can take any value. Um, it's a continuous um, quantity. Um, compare that with the digital uh, representation. So first of all, in both um, the synchronous and the asynchronous um, signals that I show you here, you can clearly see there's only really two values. There's a low value and a high value. Now, what's the difference between an asynchronous and a synchronous signal? Let's say, for example, sake, with respect to this analog signal, define that anything in the analog signal that's over the line will be a high um, value. Anything below the middle line will be a low. And then you can see that the asynchronous signal here um, pretty much follow this um, analog signal whenever it crosses the line. So we have this crossing here and this crossing here. Anytime this is above the line, we get a high. Anytime we're below the line, we'll get a low. Now. The difference between synchronous and asynchronous um, systems is that the synchronous systems will not actually look at this analog signal all the time. They will only look at it or sample it 
at um, the clock ticks. And then you can see that if we now um, take it in respect to the clock, the synchronous signal only changes on a clock tick. So what happens when there's a clock tick? It goes to this analog signal and say, where are you now? Oh, it's a high value, it's above the line. I will fix my value on a high until I get the next clock tick. In the next clock, clock tick here, we sample the analog signal again and the uh, synchronous system goes low. Now you might think that's a bit of a waste. I mean, if we can do things um, immediately as they happen, why not do this? In fact, what you will realize there in the course, that most of the systems that we will um, work with are synchronous systems, and they're always um, synchronized to some clock. It makes designing um, digital system a whole lot easier by far um, building asynchronous systems, like truly asynchronous systems, is a very, very difficult task. Um, so it simplifies the design takes, uh, tasks by a lot. And this is what let us um, sort of go and build very complex systems. Now, this is another um, sort of representation of what I said before um, about the signal. We have the middle line anytime. Um, we cross, um, we, we're um, at the top side of the middle line, then it will be defined as a 1. If we're um, underneath the line, it will be defined as a 0. This is the ideal case. Um, we don't live in an ideal world. Um, and what really happens in reality is we make definitions. Um, we give voltage levels and ranges um, to our signals. We can say, and, and you'll see why there's a difference between them, um, that when we're talking about input, <coughs> anything between 0.6 volt to 1.1 volt will be um, taken to be a high. Anything um, underneath um, 0.4 volts to minus, um, well, let's say anything underneath 0.4 volt will be taken as a low. If we happen um, and our input signal is somewhere in this um, white region, it will be undefined. Undefined can um, make a system think that it's either a high or a low, but we can't predict what's going to happen in this region. Um, now, the reason why we want to have um, sort of this configuration on an input signal is because we allow a very wide range um, of input, of um, mar well, large margins for both the high and the low signals. Meaning if our system is something that takes input from a communication line, and let's say the system on the other side transmitted at one volt, and that was, I don't know, 100 kilometers away, and then the signal um, went through the transmission line, and it got to our system, but it experienced a lot of noise on the way, then it might fall down to, say, um, 0.7 of a volt. We have to recognize that even though we're getting a 0.7, the system on the other side really uh, wanted to transmit a high voltage. And this is the robustness that um, digital systems um, let us. If there was a lot of noise, and we actually went down all the way to this region here, our system uh, will have mistaken this for a low value, and then uh, we got the wrong signal from the other side, or we interpreted um, in a wrong way. Uh, but this is why we have error correction algorithms, and we can actually recover from this um, using quite sophisticated methods. Um, on the output side, you can see that the ranges are not as large. And this is because we actually have um, the ability to design our system. It's our system. Um, we're not dependent on anything else. We have the ability to design our system to be more um, accurate in the The only problems that we might have in some internal noise in the circuit, some of the noise um, we can minimize, but some of this we just can't get rid of. So we will have slight variation, but usually it will be in um, much more confined um, range of voltages. And this is, again, this is where the robustness of um, digital systems come from. Um, other 
um, systems that might use other physical quantities, not necessarily uh, voltages. So if we're talking about a microprocessor or a CPU, we are talking about high and low voltages. Um, if you're talking about a hard drive, hard drives write their data as magnetic field directions. So uh, one direction will represent a zero, the other direction will represent a one. But again, we can interpret it either as a one of two values. Um, compact disks, they actually um, use surface pits and lens uh, where it's not so accurate. You might think that one represents zero, the other one represents one. Um, it's not quite the case when you talk about compact disks. So just as a net general knowledge, um, the data encrypted on or the data written to compact disks are actually written as a transition. If there is a transition between um, a pit and a land, that symbolizes a one. If we start with a pit and we stay with a pit, or if we start with start with a land and we stay with the land, that represents a zero. And this uh, actually gives us um, a little bit more you know, robustness into um, compact disks. And then there's the DRAMs um, that are based on electric charge and you can think about it as um, there exists or there doesn't exist um, some electric charge and some capacitor uh, to remember our um, zeros and ones. Now, <coughs> um, something I forgot to um, tell you before, I really like having an interactive um, lecture. I like if you have questions, I'm happy for you to raise your hand. Um, on the same token, if I have questions and ask you, um, I would like to hear people, um, your thoughts. Um, throughout the, the course, I will sort of present questions out there. Um, I know a lot of people are shy, nobody wants to talk, why should I talk? Uh, please try to get over yourself and um, do talk. Um, so here's a question for you. Um, this leading up to number systems. When um, you, know, you, you grew up in primary school, you learn mathematics and they teach you, you have 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And using those um, 10 digits, we can build pretty much any number that we want. And then we can do arithmetic on those numbers. And then we can do a whole lot of things. And then we can invent the iPhone. Now, why do we have 10 digits? Why 10? Why not? 10 fingers? Yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah. So the claim is that you know we have ten fingers. So the ancient people that invented mathematics said uh, it's easy to count. Let's count to ten, um, which is probably the case. In fact, this is the case. Um, but there's nothing special about um, counting with ten digits. I mean, this is what we know. This is what we're um, used to and comfortable with. Um, there used to be some ancient tribes that actually used base 20 or they had 20 <coughs> digits because they used their um, leg toes as well. Um, which obviously their mathematics look um, a whole lot different. Um, what base does um, Bart Simpson use? Yeah. So the Simpsons only have eight fingers. Um, they probably do everything in base eight. <laughs> it's those things they don't tell you about. Now another thing about um, our um, sort of our arithmetic system, our mathematics, this is the, the, the thing that we're used to and we know, it's what's called a positional um, numbering system. So we know that um, if we want to express a value of a number, let's say um, 42, then we just use the digits that we have. We use the 4, we use the 2, but because the 4 is to the left of the 2, we know this symbolizes a larger number than whether if it was um, just a 4 by itself. So 4 by itself will represent 4 units. Uh, 42 in this case represents uh, 4 tenths. 4 tenths plus the 2. So the more digits we actually add to it, say if I added a 1, all of a sudden this 4 now represents 400. So it's very much dependent on where in the number our digit is found um, in order to give, you, uh, to give it a, the actual value. Anybody has any 
thoughts about non-positional systems? Okay. Roman numerals, yeah. Um, so if I wanted to write, for example, well, let's go with 2141. So 2141 in Roman numerals. V is 5. Either 50 minus 10 or 4x's. We don't do 4x's. Well, we could actually. But. Yeah, 15 in Romans. L? XL1. XL1. I? Agree? So M's stand for a thousand. Um, the C is a hundred. Um, the XL, X is a ten, L is fifty. We do the fifty minus ten plus the one. So we get the two one four one. That is correct. Now, um, to show you that it's a non positional um, system, if I now added another I at the end, I uh, will go to 2142, uh, 2142. But I didn't change um, any of the values here just because I moved them uh, one position to the left in a way. So Romans is a, um, a non positional system. Uh, what we know um, is what we know and used to is the positional system. Now this, the, this um, emphasis on, on the fact that it is a positional system um, will come in very handy uh, when we talk about binary stuff. Now to finish the lecture off, let me show you what happens when we don't quite use positional systems. Uh, I'll get there, I'll find the volume. Just give me a second. Um, just so you know, this is a terrible system to work with. Uh, there we go. Uh, about the percentage. I figure 75% to you, Bob, and 25% divided between the five of us. Give that crowbar myself, Tom and the baby. That makes 5% for each one of us. Ah, Billy, you're cheating yourself. If there's 25% divided among the five of you, that's 14% apiece. Oh, no, listen, Bob. I, I wouldn't cheat you. You know I wouldn't. Now, look. Look here. I'll show you. We're going to run this out here. And come on. 25 divided by 5 is... Five. You see, if the five won't win it too well. No. But five goes into twenty-five five times. You see? No, you're wrong, Billy. Now now I'm a pretty good mathematician. Now five into twenty-five. Five won't go into two well. No. But five goes into five once. Now, we didn't use the two before, so we're going down here. Now five into twenty goes four times. There you are. Five into twenty-five, fourteen. No, look, uh, Now let me prove it to you. Uh, by multiplication, uh, five times five. Five times five is twenty-five. Surprise to learn. Huh? I'm surprised that you learned. Now I'll show you. Five times fourteen is twenty-five. Five times four is twenty. Five times one is five. Five times five. That's it. No, no, look, Ma. Look, you're wrong there because you know, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll, and we'll put down four, five fourteens here. Fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. There. Now, now I'll prove to you by addition that, that five fourteens is not twenty-five. Four, eight, ten, sixteen, twenty. Twenty-one, twenty-two. <laughs>
Hey.